Uh, good morning and welcome to the 25th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2017. Uh, 17. Could I ask everyone in the room to ensure their mobile phones are on silent. It's acceptable to use mobile devices for social media, but please don't photograph or record proceedings. The first my item on our agenda uh, is a final evidence session on technology and innovation in health and social care. Can I welcome to the committee Shona Robinson, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport. Jeff Huggins, Director for Health and Social Care Integration, and Graham Galt, uh, General Manager, ICT NHS, Dumfries and Galloway, and Head of eHealth at the Scottish uh, Government. Um, could I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement? Thanks, uh, Convener. Um, I welcome the, the very timely focus of this inquiry as we develop our new digital health and care strategy jointly with uh, COSLA. For many years, our health and care system has been underpinned by IT. Indeed, there are very few aspects of, of care which doesn't involve, at some point, the use of electronic tools, whether it's to enable the capture of patient information for clinical decision-making, to enable communication between professionals, or to record data for vitally important research. Our existing e-health strategies and investment over the years has resulted in every clinical or care professional requiring and using ICT to do their jobs effectively in a modern healthcare setting. However, uh, very little of what I've just listed is to do with how patients uh, engage with the health service or manage their conditions remotely. In virtually ever, every other industry, digital has transformed the customer experience in a relatively short order of time. We've gone from, for example, watching someone else book our holidays at a travel agent to having a vast array of choice and control over what and how we book online. Uh, not only that, thanks to advances in mobile technology, we can do so from the comfort of our own homes or at a time and place convenient to us wherever we may be. The evidence received and heard by this committee, along with the extensive feedback that we've received through our own engagement, suggests a growing expectation for the same sort of flexibility, choice and control in health and social care, underpinned by effective core infrastructure across Scotland. And it's with that in mind that we shaped our draft vision around the individual, and I'm pleased that it's been well received by your correspondents. Our previous e-health strategies largely de delivered the infrastructure that was required to deliver safe and effective care within the NHS. And our new strategy is shaping up to develop and deliver the infrastructure tools and products that is now and will be required to underpin the radical transformation across health and social care, which this parliament has supported. Our new focus on digital health and care in the round will lead to greater information sharing across health and social care. It will enable people to take greater care of their health and well-being, and it will lead to the shifting of the balance of care out of hospital and into the community, and it will lead to greater remote working for staff and remote access to services for patients. Fundamentally, it will equip our health and care services with the tools needed to deliver a transform transformation uh, into 21st century place-based care. In doing this, it will build on the excellent work progressed over the past decade. We've successfully rolled out and mainstreamed telecare within social care. The emergency care summary provides a vital electronic summary of everyone's GP record for out-of-hours care across Scotland. And the number of remote interactions handled by NHS 24 continues to grow every year. Every secondary clinician in the west of Scotland can access a single clinical portal with excellent examples of clinical portals everywhere in Scotland. Some services are routinely delivered via video conferencing, including vital life-saving stroke uh, thrombolysis delivered over the national VC network. Primary care records are now entirely digital and we're well on our way to digitising all secondary care records. We've established a number of innovation centres, including one with a specific focus on digital health and care. Almost all referrals for primary care are electronic. Our renal and sky diabetes systems are recognised as world leading and we're starting to develop scalable approaches to remote monitoring and remote management of long term conditions. And we have an NHS wide email system allowing for instant communication across staff teams. Um, this goes some way, I think, in highlighting the scale of what has been achieved over the past decade. They are all essential systems and approaches that require continued development and use. It also provides an indication of the scale of the challenge we face in shifting our focus uh, and tools for our citizens. Um, 
Furthermore, as the, the WannaCry ransomware attack highlighted, the sheer volume of devices and systems that are now connected to the internet presents a challenge in and of itself. Our new strategy has to balance the need for continually innovating and developing approaches to the delivery of care with the real pressing safety issue of ensuring our existing infrastructure remains secure and fit for purpose. So in order to achieve this convener, we'll set out an implementation plan and an infrastructure plan to accompany our strategy. Um, Finally, there, there are some good uh, global exemplars in terms of some of the individual digital uses, solutions in use, uh, including here in Scotland and in countries such as Finland and Estonia, which the committee has heard about. But every healthcare institution in the world now needs to manage the change in emphasis from a 1990s IT-focused approach to a 2020s digital citizen-focused approach. I look forward to discussing that with you in more detail. Thanks very much uh, for that. Before we go into questions, we have um, apologies from Marie Todd, and uh, I could remind members before they speak, if they want, or, or if, in fact, we'll just do it now to declare any interest that they have, and I'll begin. <laughs> and uh, a mem close member of my family works in the uh, health IT sector. Brian? Just to remind uh, everybody that uh, I'm a director of a um, collaboration communication platform across sectors, which includes healthcare, and I don't take any remuneration from that post. Anyone else? No. Uh, okay, uh, Miles, would you like to begin? Thank you. And good morning to the panel. And listening to um, your statement, Cabinet Secretary, I think one of the things which I, I couldn't speak for the whole um, committee, but I think there's, from the evidence we've heard, there seems to be a real frustration within clinicians that changes in technology and the way of harnessing some of the technology which could transform the way we deliver health care isn't happening. And the missed opportunities and frustration um, we've seen from clinicians um, has been quite clear on that. And so I really wanted to start with where's, what's the government's vision on this? And specifically when you mentioned Estonia and Finland and their approaches, is that where you see Scotland going? And specifically, do you think resources have to be allocated to achieve that? Well, I mean, I, I get the, the, the frustration um, in that, you know, it, uh, we all want things to have happened yesterday rather than tomorrow but you know the scale of what we're trying to achieve here is is huge um, in my opening remarks I, I tried to lay out some of the successes and progress that has been made um, but you know I don't for a second claim that the job is done and we're laying out um, in our new uh, uh, strategy the the focus very much on the the service user and the end user and their interaction with health and care services. We've spent a lot of money and time making sure we build infrastructure up and have laid out some of the successes in doing that. And of course, the infrastructure and in general practice, um, the, there is a, a huge overhaul of that. Graham can, can say a little bit more about that if you, um, if you want more detail, but we have talked about that here at committee before. But the focus going forward is really in taking um, a huge big step forward as the strategy uh, lays out into uh, how we make sure that we can um, support our service users and health and care services to interact uh, more readily and, and make use of not just their own data but their interactions with health and care, whether that's a, an outpatient appointment delivered um, through um, a, a remote system and, and actually at the moment we've had quite a lot of success uh, with the rollout of that. I think there's around 2,000 users now uh, in, in terms of the Attend Anywhere video consultation. That's you know <coughs> a big shift in in uh, in in the way that very simple interaction happens, but it saves a huge amount of time for not just the consultant, but the 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 patient who might not have to do a five six hour round trip uh, for that appointment. That's one example, but it, the focus is very much on that interaction rather than necessarily the the infrastructure we have. Uh, a lot of the infrastructure in place and are putting the rest of the infrastructure in place, particularly in primary care, but the focus is on that end user and how we make it easier for people to interact with our health and care services and in, in, indeed how you, the point you made um, around the, the clinician's uh, use of the system 
and making sure that we um, drive the most efficient, effective use for, for them as well. Did Mr Gould want to mention your work? Uh, really, just to, to add to Cabinet Secretary's uh, response there, um, there are a lot of frustration in clinical areas. Um, I don't think we have going to sit and apologise for not um, you know, trying to keep up with the latest either gadgetry or you know, innovative you know, state-of-the-art, because that brings with it a whole bundle of management around security, around risk, around information governance, and whereby a lot of common practice is, well, if I could just do this quickly, uh, I've got an app that can do this, I can, you know, I can do this on a very small scale. We're, we're very conscious of trying to embrace that world, but at the same time trying to make sure that we're not disclosing or, or make sure we're managing all the ass digital assets that we're, we're building in Scotland. Can I just make... Thanks. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, <laughs> I, I guess a, a couple of ideas which are probably fairly central to what I think will be in the strategy. And, and the first is the idea that we have a common platform um, across Scotland, because at the moment, if you have an idea or an innovation, you have to customise it you know, 14 or 17 times to interact with the existing <coughs> system. So this idea of a single platform is, is pivotal. I think the second key idea, and it was you know, very much um, at the front of what the Cabinet Secretary said in her opening remarks, is the idea that digital isn't a separate thing, it's partly how, it's how we do things. And so in things such as the modern outpatient work, or the work that we're doing around elective care more generally, or the work we're doing on unscheduled care, it needs to be built into the thinking about how we're designing and planning services. It's not something that we do after. And, and that's a, a key shift in terms of where di di digital fits in. So I think those two ideas are central to getting clinicians more front and centre in terms of the, the style and the nature of um, innovation that they want. Okay, just make a final point. One of the th aspects which was really pressed home to us was a once for Scotland approach. Um, and the fact that, especially from a patient's or individual's perspective, just telling that information constantly to different professionals doesn't seem to be changing. Do you think that you've heard that message and that's actually um, being changed? Yes. Um, um, you know, as, as Jeff just said, you know, we do need to move away from, um, you know, four, 14 times or 22 times, include the, the, the national boards, um, from, from a board level implementation towards a, what you've described, a once for Scotland you know, national system. And, and we're looking at how, how we do that and implementation plan will, will set that out. But that may require us to do more uh, from a strategic uh, point of view from government. And that may mean that we hold more of the resources in order to do that on a once for Scotland approach. Um, and, you know, that... I think we've been discussing that uh, very much with NHS chief executives. They are, they, are, they agree um, that there are certain aspects of taking this forward that are better done at the national level and done once. Um, and uh, clearly, there will still need to be resources flowing to boards for some infrastructure and, um, and making sure we have the training and personnel in place. That's a critical part of this. But without a doubt, we have... We'd already heard that message very much and learnt some of the lessons, I think, around the, uh, around that. And as Jeff also said, the, the, the fact that this is going to be a, a built in as a key part of every transformation we make, well, every transformation we make will be a Scotland-wide transformation. So the modern outpatient changes, um, the, the, the mod new models, primary care, the, these are, are Scotland-wide um reforms and transformations so it's quite right and proper we do things in a, a consistent way and of course there's economies of scale in that as well which are important so um so the short answer is yes um and we'll be laying that out very clearly could, could i just offer some because the the particular example you asked about was when you turn up at your general practitioner or at any &E, yeah. and you have to tell your story again and, and it's it's quite an interesting one because it, for many people, that is exactly the reaction. Why do I have to keep telling my story? Why do you have to keep taking the data? And there's clearly some data which you can probably hold in a way which enables it to be available. 
at the same time, certainly the experience that you know that I've had of working with people in um, the mental health and other spaces is quite often people are surprised that you know things about them and are concerned. So they the interaction between being able to 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 have that functionality but also protect people's wishes as to how they want to be worked with is really quite tricky. Uh, and it, you know one of the big challenges around governance because. It's not like um, Amazon or something like that, where you can decide simply go to the shops. You know, we're pretty much a monopoly supplier of health and care, so we have to find ways to interact with different people and their different expectations. So, you know, once for Scotland, um, although it's it's a new can term, which is which is really quite quite, um, quite a good concept for people to embrace. Scotland's been doing a lot of once for Scotland for a lot of years now in NHS. There's a single network across the entire NHS, there's a single way to refer patients between primary and secondary care, we've got a single emergency care summary, we've got single business systems around payroll, HR, um, you know, management, time management solutions. So we're already pretty far down this road. I think the, the important part though is that if you want to push that to the, to the clinical work for the, 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 the cold face of, of where the clinicians are interacting with the with the, the, the patients, that's where the, 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 the exciting part is for uh, going forward. Thank you. Cabinet okay, Secretary, can I pick up on just one thing you said? Um, you said that GP records are on, primary care records are now digitised. We had last week, I think, from one of the witnesses from a uh, university who said that some practices don't even have Wi-Fi. Um, and so is that... Is that a correct statement, an, an accurate yes. statement? Yes, Graham, do okay, you want to? So, so um, most, most of our held pa patient records within general practice are already digitised. Okay? Most, uh, well, all practices, all general practices um, networks allow access to these via uh, their, their local computer servers within the practices. Um, usually in the form of all communications, all documents, all bits of paper, handwritten, as well as uh, communication in and out of the practice between primary and secondary care and social care. Um, all digitised and accessible uh, instantly when you are presenting at in front of a, of a general practitioner. The, the, the reference to Wi-Fi is, 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 is different because you know a lot of practices don't have Wi-Fi enabled at this point. There's two parts to that. Um, the first one is about making sure the, that environment is secure, um, but that's not a functioning part of having records digitised and accessible at point of care delivery. That's already um, that's already uh, pretty much taken care of. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm reading some stuff here from the Care Commission um, uh, about uh, primary care records, and they're saying that. Um, <coughs> It's, in case, it's been done on a priority basis, the digitisation of um, uh, um, records, and that going back historically is very difficult and it's patchy. Okay. The, what that's probably referring to in context, uh, for me, mm -hmm. um, is that when what happens over, over tens of years when you and I visit our general practitioner is that we build up a case record which sometimes can go to a relatively thick uh, volume, if you like. Um, what what has been running alongside that for now 12 years is an electronic um, processing of the exact same pieces of paper. And over that period, people have now migrated from receiving paper coming in, either scribbling or actioning it from paper, to now doing it all on, online. That's happening now. Um, what then has happened to some of the care record for you, you and I um, in the practice, some of the paper records are still in storage and perhaps not been back scanned. And I think that's probably the point there. Like what they're saying is many of the acute and primary care records we scrutinise were hard copy paper records, often with handwritten entries by clinicians and other health professionals. Some hard copy uh, patients' records were lengthy and covered treatment over decades from a wide range of heart, uh, health specialties. So that is, that's the care inspector saying that that's what they're finding now, is that yeah. they're still finding large numbers with hard paper copy records. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a difference between, you know, there's a basic level of, of patient record that is in, that is digital. Um, but if you go back decades to every bit of paper relating to that patient, not all of the, every bit of paper will have been scanned, but there'll be a basic level of information that is digital for every patient. And, and, and I think right. that's the difference. Yeah. 
I don't think that's what it's saying. It's saying many of the acute and primary care records we scrutinise were hard copy paper records. They're not saying that it's just um, long historic ones. They're saying many of them that they've seen. So maybe we could look into that and maybe mm -hmm. further... Um, yeah, happy, happy we'll happy do that. Yeah. Just look into that and give further information to the committee. Sorry, I, I didn't intend bringing that up, but it was just the right no, moment we'll, for we'll, it. we'll come back to you on um, that. Brian. Good morning, panel. Um, I'm interested around the... the the process after tech uh, technology is approved for use within the NHS. The evidence we've heard is that the, then the issue is around rollout and encouraging kind of, of adoption of that technology within, and because there's so much of an autonomy within the individual clinician. If, if, if we're going to really bring technology uh, up to date, how what, what the, what's the plan then to to, um, to 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 roll it out to encourage that adoption within within the sort of the clinicians? And I think this is where the balance is. We're going to shift to a more strategic, um, what once for Scotland approach, as we've just been talking about. So, the things that we agree need to be done and need to be everywhere are the things that will be done on a once for Scotland approach, and we'll make sure that those um, those things are are done well and done everywhere. Um, there, I mean, there may still be some innovations um, uh, that you know, testing the water on. Uh, on, on some uh, other aspects, but the core things that, that are absolutely essential that need to be done everywhere will be done on a consistent -wide yeah. basis. And I think that's the mm -hmm. essentially the where the, the balance will lie and shift more to a kind of national strategic sure. Sure. approach. And probably just, just supporting that, um, the government are funding and, and their different approaches to, is to look at a, a different approach to clinical leadership in this area. So they're looking to appoint a CCIO, a Chief Clinical Information Officer, um, and that'll that'll be the the pinnacle of how we disseminate standard uh, practice and try and get this once for Scotland deployed in a in a truly once for Scotland way. <clears throat> um, to support that, also we're appointing uh, five new uh, staff to go through a digital academy with the other four nations. We're all contributing financially to allow that that energy to be good. But I think the point you make is, 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 is real. Um, and, and at times we do allow too much uh, variation. And, and I think the time is now um, through our Once for Scotland approach to try and improve standardisation. For me, would you then envisage then with, with giving clinicians time within their working day then uh, to learn, le learn about innovation and technology and, and to, to, to encourage that sort of adoption. Is, is, that, the, is that what you're thinking? I mean, the, the, the training, I mean, everybody's got a kind of basic level because they all interact some way or another with, with uh, electronic uh, digital systems. Um, but of course, um, the rollout of, of any new systems brings with it the, a, a training requirement for those that are, are using it. Um, but you know, if you look at the the secondary care clinicians in the west of Scotland accessing a single clinical portal, that actually saves um, a huge amount of time for them because they're able to access uh, test results and so on and so forth re remotely, um, uh, and that saves a lot of time. So investing the time up front to enable those clinicians to to do that and that, and and is is yeah. well well worthwhile because they then gain a huge amount of time back because it's of, of easier access and that's one one example yeah, yeah and I, I guess the other element is thinking about how we actually do the, take the change process forward because historically what we've done is we've done change around service design and service delivery in one space you know quite often through healthcare improvement scotland and then we've done support for change around tech in a different space and, and you really need to bring those together because it needs to be part of the workflow in terms of how you approach it. I think one of the big ambitions is also to um, be able to automate more so that there's less time taken in data transcription, data entry, so that people are actually getting time back as part of the process. And I, I guess that's one of the things which you always hear and we don't always get, but it's a, a clear objective to actually see that as being part of the process so that, so that the time does come back. That there's a real design component to this and that people will engage with technology where they believe it gives them value. And, and a lot of people's experience at the moment is that it doesn't. It, it's seen as um, an additional task over and above what they're there to do. So in, until you're at the point where this is part of how you do clinical care and you're seeing the return from 
your engagement with the technology, it will always be hard. So that that's again part of the change that we have to make. That's probably why the West of Scotland thing has worked so well because clinicians were talking to each other about the benefit. And that yeah. it just took on a kind of momentum of its own, and everybody wanted to be yeah. part of that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just, yeah, just as um, I think we heard evidence um, a couple of weeks ago of, of again around the adoption of quite a simple technology um, by a, an NHS trust who bought a, a, a fair vast number of these particular in instruments, but the clinicians remained with the old ones because that's what they were used to, and as you say, didn't feel the need to, uh, that it would it'd be a beneficial for, for them. So how do you overcome that sort of inertia? I think it's got to be clinical buy-in. I mean, there's got to be, clinicians have to see the, the, the purpose and the benefit for for themselves and for their patients. Um, and you know, all of these innovations, there's clinical involvement uh, in them to make sure that the the right Things and it's not, you know, otherwise there's a dislocation between the, the coal face and using that, that technology. So clinicians are, are very much involved. And the clinical leadership of then taking that forward and rolling it out and scaling it up is, is hugely important because they're the best advocates for, for change. Um, you know, so ultimately that will be a, a critical part in, in doing this. And the modern outpatient example is a good one. Cl um, clinicians get. The, the purpose of being able to, particularly in the highlands and islands, of using technology to to have you know, straightforward, simple interactions with patients in a, an outpatient context, it's a bit of a no-brainer. Um, and it's so. I, I guess you, you've you've got to make it easy to do, and you've got to give the sense that they'll offer better care. Because I, I imagine the clinicians who have talked to you on this. Um, are probably not going down to the high street and booking their holidays anymore. You know, they're they're you know they're probably buying most of their books online. So they in those areas they've made the switch. You know, they haven't said I'm going to hold on to, you know, going down and speaking to somebody across a desk who'll book. So you, it has to be it's a design problem and it's a it's a benefit problem. And that a lot of that comes back to how we take the change forward. Thank you. you the appointment of chief clinical information officer. A number of the submissions that we have. Uh, we, we've had uh, identified that there was not any named accountable body or person for scaling up and implementing um, new successful innovation and technology. Is that what this person's going to be accountable for? So is there now a named person, so to speak? Uh, is there a named person who has the responsibility, who ultimately that lies with, or is it still going to be all the health boards and all the IGBs and everybody else in this crowded field? Well, the, and it is a crowded field, and that's one of the areas that needs to, to be fully resolved through a, a simplifying of the governance and accountability structure. So that, that is happening and will happen. But the, the, the chief clinical information officer will be, if you like, at the head of the kind of the, the pinnacle of driving forward um, all these changes, so they will they will have a strategic role in making sure that they uh, drive forward um, the, uh, the 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 strategy uh, and make sure there's a pace to the delivery of it. And then uh, within that governance structure, there will be obviously linkages into uh, boards and IGBs in terms of making sure that uh, that, that 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 happens. But that leadership role. Uh, is going to be really, really critical, and uh, yeah, I guess you know the the uh, for for me that's going to be important because I'll have a, a single point of contact of somebody who is kind of hit, if you like, for driving this forward, uh, and you know making sure uh, that there's a, a a piece of of delivery. I, I think it's I think it has to be seen as part of a package in the the that that sort of technical. Um, knowledge and expertise is, is a part of a package, but the other components are um, appropriate governance at national level for how the system in terms of interoperability, standards and respective data, but having overall oversight and respect of the architecture. Um, and then being probably part of the process by which innovation rolls forward, because not all innovation is IT innovation. Some of the innovation that we're looking at here is, is also other types of products, you know, new types of scaffold, things like that, which wouldn't be exactly in this space. But again, you know, we've recognised the need to have appropriate governance, um, which allows 
um, quick and safe adoption of new technologies within the space. But I think you're going to see quite a change in terms of the overall governance of how this is taken forward. Hey, Alex. Thank you. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning to the officials as well. Thank you for coming to see us today. Um, I don't for a minute doubt the integrity of your vision in, term, in respect of the deployment of tech and innovation in the health service, absolutely. Um, my sense of it, however, is that um, it seems to be happening at different rates and that in some fields we are racing ahead and to great effect and to great impact, um, but there are other aspects of the health service which are still stuck and, and dragging uh, along behind. And I think the, the greatest sense of that came from GPs who made representation to this about individual practice software, which is still sometimes stuck on operating systems that are 15 years old, perhaps. And we heard quite eloquently a representation last week about um, a GP who's literally having to wait for the hourglass to tick round before they can access patient records or um, um, prescribing software, the rest of it. How, uh, and that, uh, we interrogated that. We were, and that's not the fault of the GP practices. That that's brought in by the health board. How do we, as a, how does your government, how do we as a parliament, uh, get that right? Because that strikes me that that's having an impact not just on patient experience, but on GP morale, throughput, and time taken uh, appointments. Yeah. I mean, I think you're you're right in that there there are different rates and, and paces of of things that have happened, and I, I guess in that is. I would be I would have been surprised if that hadn't been the case, given that some things are harder to do than, than others. Um, so when you think about the extent of the of the primary care estate and the, the GP estate, it, it's um, there are a lot of sites in a lot of different areas, um, and some of those have more challenges than others in terms of connectivity. Uh, however, it has been an absolute priority for us, and Graham can lay out some of the detail around the procurement and that has just taken place around the, the GP sure. IT systems, which will make a huge difference. So, so there's a number of things which I think I think what you've observed and you're, you've picked up is correct. Um, there's a number of things that we're doing. So first and foremost, uh, the technology layer delivering general practice software is changing, and it's now all going web-based. Okay, so as you probably know that, that means that the reliance on local processing, local uh, hardware becomes a lot less. Okay, it's all done in the, in the, uh, remotely. Um, but to support that, an upgrade to the Scottish Wide Area Network, which every general practitioner is connected to, is being implemented. And that's got minimum up upgrades and download speeds now to, to support this. So again, that's a big improvement opportunity. Um, there is no doubt that in the extreme areas where general practitioner services are delivered in very rural Scotland, um, there are some challenges with infrastructure, even getting signals at very basic uh, transmission rates. Um, so there will be an ongoing challenge in that area, but everything we're doing regarding infrastructure for general practice is, is aimed to really give radical and, and centralised much better improvement. And the commitment on broadband will also help in terms of making sure the connectivity in, in those more remote and rural areas is improved, which will have a huge knock-on effect for, for health and care. I, I think the other thing which we've recognised is if we are moving to a new type of architecture, there'll be quite an extensive transition that will have to be made with legacy systems. And one of the things that we've asked the um, expert panel, which is chaired by David Bates from, from Harvard um, School of Public Health to do, is to advise us on prioritisation within that mm -hmm. so that we do the things in the, in the right and the best order to get the best outcome. The, the other challenge that we have is at the moment, much of the time, certainly within my directorate on, on digital, is spent probably doing what you might describe as small fixes. Um, and fixing small problems and, and we need while there is some of that which we will need to do we need to get um, more focused on the, the big strategic changes and the architecture that we need to make and it's that balance between things which we absolutely must do now and things which take us into the next stage which is really quite important and uh, I, th I think that's again one of the shifts that we're trying to make through the strategy that we have this clear platform on which we can do better things um, but that's some fundamental architecture things rather than lots of small fixes. Thank you. That, that's very gratifying to hear. Um, and it links to my next question, really, which is about the kind of uh, um, the, the siloed, not siloed mentality, but the siloed nature of IT systems that e exist across the whole health service. And by which I don't just mean 
primary care, I mean allied health professionals, other community pharmacists, the rest of it. And um, we have heard, not just in this inquiry, but in inquiries previously, um, that that is a barrier. That, for example, uh, community pharmacists having no compatibility with software or, or access to patient notes and that being an actual structural problem in terms of the IT, system, IT systems used um, is getting in the way of patient care um, and is the barrier to perhaps giving more role to community pharmacists. I use that as an example, but there are many examples of that kind. We heard a representation about uh, a system that NHS Greater London is using, which is described as a kind of, a kind of a spinal column um, of a software platform into which all these other na uh, necessarily different software structures that these other groups use can plug into and via which you know they can share a lot more easily. Um, how far are we in NHS Scotland from doing that and uh, is it a priority? I mean just an observation for and I'll let these guys do more of the detail but um, I mean the technical solution to that is probably not the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge would be the data sharing and making sure that that is done within obviously the um, appropriate governance and that um, we obviously need to make sure that we satisfy all the standards required in order to have the, the sharing of, of data um, between uh, professionals that need to share enough of the data for the right purposes in order to deliver a safe uh, service uh, for that for that patient. So. Um, so those are the issues that are absolutely critical and, and are being worked through. Um, and, you know, there is a huge appetite, as you know, um, to get on with the, the, the multidisciplinary working in primary care. But in order to facilitate that, these are absolutely the things that need to be done um, at enough of a level in order to have that, that uh, data sharing. Before you bring in, in, mm -hmm. that, before you bring in Jeff... Um, just, I mean, I agree with you, and as a Liberal, naturally I would, because it's important for me that, you know, patients ultimately have a right to confidentiality. They need to know how their data is being used and how that data is being shared. But we do have examples of it being used, that occurring elsewhere, in, other, in, in well, it must be happening in NHS Greater London, um, and it's about getting that right. And, and, and we talked a bit about citizen ownership of health data, that they, either through... Um, giving their permission by inputting a password in, say, a community pharmacist or, or actually ha having something on which their data is stored on their person, um, th there are solutions to that. So is, that, is the barrier to that here that we, we just have to enact primary legislation which sets that out, um, or, or is that something that we just you know, need to adopt through a more piecemeal approach? Well, I don't think we want to do it piecemeal, and I, th I think we probably, you know, I don't think there's a necessary requirement for different legislation, although, you know, there are the EU regulations that are, are around the governance of all of this, which we we'll, we'll all have to comply with, which are important. Um, but I think it's it's more, I mean, interestingly, Spire, which has a, is a good example of involving patient um, and in, in, in what their data is going to be used for has been quite a, a good lesson for us. If you know, it's about transparency and making clear what 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 data is going to be used for, and importantly, what it's not going to be used for. And I guess if you were to encapsulate what people's fears would be, is that their data is somehow going to be passed on to third parties for use for you know. So we've got to be absolutely clear about the purpose. And obviously the the um, the governance and safety around around that, and I think most patients um, would would expect health professionals to have enough information about them to share in order to deliver the best quality care to them, and I, and I think m most patients would not have an issue with that. They just want assurance that that's the purpose. So, Jay. Yeah, I think it's at the moment it's one of the areas which is probably the most tricky in terms of working through the, the issues in terms of data governance. Um, and it also interacts with the different way in which you might structure data in future. And, and at the moment we have um, you know, hundreds of systems which we then have to make choices about whether you share or don't share. 
you know, if, if you reduce the number of systems, then the question becomes one of governance and access and control. Uh, and, and so you've got different questions to answer. I, th I think, you know, as the Cabinet Secretary says, you know, as we bring that up to national level, we would expect to have greater clarity and, and, and maybe less of the occurrence of this is information which is shared in this area, but it's not shared in that area because they've come to different views as to what can and can't happen. I, I think, the, the, you know, the big question that you had there, which was, you know, how quickly can you move to that new style of architecture that sort of, you described it as a spine and a, a spine or a platform is, is a good way of understanding it. Um, you know, the building blocks of those, you know, types of systems are relatively, you know, they're in, in place in other industries and other businesses. Um, you know, it does take time to do the architecture. It does take, make, take time to build it. The bigger challenge, I think, though, is around the transition, you know, particularly with lots of legacy systems and like legacy contracts. So, so you, you effectively have a two-part process there. One is to build the new, but then the second is to actually work across the system to bring its, you know, the data and the systems that are there safely onto it. I think the challenge with that is the pharmacy example which you gave is, is a really good one because historically our answer would have been to go out and find 17 different solutions for that, one for each health board, uh, the ambulance service, NHS 24, and I'm sure there's another health board that uses uses data. Uh, you know, we have to get to a situation where we, we try and fill, fill we try and solve the underlying problem by having an appropriate platform rather than just doing fixes all the time. And the advice we're getting, Jeff referred to about the prioritisation and the sequence, what order of, what sequence do you do things in in order to do them in a, a, the quickest, most effective way? And these are the best brains in the world that are advising us. We're very, very lucky to, to have them and um, fortunate to have them. And they are advising us on exactly that. So, you know, you start with this, then you do that, then you do that, and then you do that. And that's your quickest route to getting these tricky uh, problems resolved and you know so and you know if they and it may well point towards what has been done elsewhere and you know we're, we're not uh, shy of, of taking good ideas of uh, and I don't know Graham if you if there's any no, I just I just think uh, some of the references to England with its spine I mean that there's been a, a history behind creation of a spine in England and I think out the bad of a lot of of, of a lot of bad um, sort of or, or field achievement, if you like. Um, there has been some little benefits or, or significant steps forward, and I think that what you're referring to is one of them. So it is something that's good. It is something that's on our agenda. Um, and but I think, as as Cabinet Secretary said, it's it's not something where y you rush towards. It's something we've got to take at pace and bring people with us. Thank you. A number of people want in, and we're very short of time. Just one point in the information sharing I was wanting to raise was uh, the Information Commissioner's representative last week said that it wasn't the Information Commissioner that was stopping the data sharing, that was actually the um, reluctance based on a bit of fear within different sectors that they are allowed to share information. So maybe just, I, I, I'm not really asking for a comment on that, but you maybe comment on that when you're answering later just to try and catch up on some time. Colin. Thanks very much, convener, and uh, good morning to the, the panel. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned earlier uh, in your opening comments the issue of resources uh, and, and the major investment that's already taken place. Uh, the committee has received quite a lot of written and oral evidence, um, however, still expressing concern at what's been described as the limited resources um, spent on IT. I think Andy Robertson, NHS NSS, commented, we put 2% of our NHS revenue into IT, but the US is at 6%. It, it goes on to say, we have to spend more on technology and innovation in order to fund the service transformation that has to take place. Will the forthcoming e-health strategy include specific detail on what resources will be allocated towards it to make sure it's delivered? Um, so, um, just a a answering um, the convener's point in, in to, to your question, I, th I think you make a, a fair point about sometimes people are very fearful um, and sometimes that fear goes beyond the, what the reality is, and that's one of the issues we're addressing. Is what is is to try and get people to is, is to be more permissive in terms of you know what what can be done within the existing legislation. So I think I think you make a, a, a strong point there. Um, well, at the moment, if you take the global amount in terms of what's spent, it, it is around two hundred and fifty seven million pounds so if you look at the e-health division budget the um the 69 million of e-health funding allocated directly to boards 160 million spent by individual boards themselves on it and then on top of that you've got the local government spend uh on i 
IT and, and digital systems, um, which um, uh, um, will take that figure further. Anyway, first of all, what we're saying is you've got to have the right spend in the right way in the right places and prioritise that. So what we are saying is that um, the, the £69 million, particularly, that we allocate directly to boards, um, some of that will have a more national strategic direction in order to uh, get away from the, the 14 varieties or the 22 varieties, including the, the national boards. Um, so there will be a reprioritisation of the existing funding in order to make sure we spend the right money in the right places. But of course, uh, in terms of any additional spend required uh, for the, the new um, digital uh, health uh, strategy, um, we will want to make sure that we have sufficient resources, um, and obviously that will be part of the budgeting process going forward, in order to uh, make sure that is adequately resourced. So, so you know, reprioritising existing spend to be more effective with that, and then obviously if more spend is required to deliver the strategy, then we'll set that out as part of the, the budget process. Oh. Okay, just in terms of the strategy going forward as well, as well as specifying specifically what additional resources will be provided, can I ask, will it include um, specific detail around objectives and evaluation? I think that was, again, something that came from the written evidence in NHS. In fact, uh, Dumfries and Galloway Graham talked about the need for making uh, clear evidence of positive outcomes and benefits uh, should be mandatory. So will there be specific outcomes within that strategy and, uh, and how will that actually be measured going forward? Yes, yes, it will. And I think I'm, a, I'm very much a firm believer in having milestones. So you don't start off saying, well, we're going to go from there to there and we'll see if we get kind of get there in what, five, ten years time. We actually need to plot a course and have milestones. So where would we expect to be in a year's time in terms of all the complexity of this? Uh, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of systems, in terms of governance, and to plot a course so you would have very, very clear milestones and the outcomes you would expect to achieve along along that way. Graham, you're closer to sure, the, the details. Probably just just extrapolating out the, the idea that, that, that have we spent money in the past as efficiently as we possibly could have? Now, the answer to that uh, maybe would be no. Um, but that was purposely... Uh, you know, we've pushed money out to health boards, and that was our plan about just over a decade ago when that, you know, seven years ago when we did that. Um, that's about maturing local health boards to, to take, because, you know, a decade ago, there was a lot of immaturity in terms of IT delivery, um, and that allowed the local boards to to get together and cluster, actually, you know, get, get their own environments up to a level, and that was what the last sort of looking back has, has delivered. What about going forward, as the Cabinet Secretary is referencing to, is that if we have now got a level playing field and people are able to embrace new ways of working, which is where we're at now, then the spend profile should be more efficient. Um, notwithstanding the challenges we have in that area, I think we've mentioned previously here about procurement challenges. Um, the minute you scale things up, it becomes tougher. But I think the efficiency in how we're able to uh, now take things forward and doing once... Um, doing things once, single contracts for, for, for software suppliers and hardware, and sharing things is, is certainly the, the way we want to do it. Uh, measured outcomes as well, essential, and we'll be looking for me a measurable plan by health board, by region, uh, to make sure that, that the national standards are achieved. How will that be, will that be monitored? Well, we'll mon the, the, the new uh, chief clinical information officer will have a role, um, uh, we will have a role, I will have a role in making sure that we are delivering at pace what we've set out. And I'm sure the committee will take an ongoing interest in, in that as well. So, um, Jeff? Yeah, so there will be a reporting mechanism as well. Yes, yeah, so, so, so. yes. Uh, Jeff? So, so, so the intention is that there will be a national governance group that I'll chair that will monitor implementation of the strategy. Um, we will have clear milestones, and as the Cabinet Secretary said in her opening remarks, you know, one of the issues that you identified in the evidence that you've taken was the absence of an implementation plan for the 1417 strategy. We will intend to, when we publish the strategy, have a clear implementation plan with milestones with, in, within it in terms of when things will happen. In terms of the return on benefit, 
Um, so things that are in the space of outpatients or unscheduled care or what happens with a, within A and E, those are more likely to sit within other strategies and with other lines of work. And again, that comes back to the idea of looking to embed technology as part of the process by which you do normal business, rather than it being a separate thing. So the the, the, the strategy is in, is intended to be an enabler and a platform. Um, you know that is a major undertaking in itself, but that will then enables you to take the benefit in those other areas of delivery around things such as cancer or primary care. And in terms of reporting, we I don't see any reason we couldn't do a, either a yearly report to committee or to parliament. If that would be in line with your thinking. I'm sure, we would appreciate mm -hmm. that. Yeah, Claire. Thank you, convener, and thank you to the panel for coming along. I was wanting to pick up on a, the issue of data sharing that, that obviously was t touched on briefly earlier, and we've had a, we had a lot of uh, written and oral submissions to the committee about access to data, and we've had some discussion about that already. So, um, but one of the, the proposals that was put forward was that perhaps the individual owned their data and it was them who made a decision about who to share that with. And I was wondering if there was, if the, uh, the panel had any comment on that. Jeff, if you want. Yeah, I, I, so I think our starting point is that we do work on the basis that the individual owns their own data. Um, it, it's complicated because then you have the situation that the, the NHS in some shape or form or particular other bodies will be the controller of the controller of the data. And our challenge at the moment is that while we are doing the work in the patient portal in the west of Scotland, the idea that you own your that you own your data doesn't give you a lot of value. Um, you know, it doesn't give you use value of your data, so you're not able to interact with it. You're not able to use it meaningfully. Um, and we think that the process of both putting the idea of the person front uh, and centre of the strategy, but also prioritising the use value of data for individuals is one of the key components of transformation in this area because once you're able to use your data, you will manage your health in a different way. Um, and that's been the experience of all other areas. So we, you know, we, 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 would, ag we would agree with that proposition. Um, it does take you into the space then of understanding, and we've had some conversation already, about issues to do with consent and management and control and understanding that different people have different expectations in that space. But you know, we're increasingly familiar with that. Um, you know, when I go onto the Scottish Parliament website, um, if I haven't been on for a while, um, it asks me, do I accept cookies? You know, it expects, do I allow some of my personal data to be shared with your server somewhere in this building? Uh, and I then get the ch chance to say yes or no to that. So, you know, we're increasingly literate about these issues uh, and we need to build systems which are as simple as that to enable people to consent um, to how their data is used. So we, we welcome many of the responses that you've had in that space and we think they're part of the way forward. And, uh, can I ask, picking up on that, and, and an issue I think it was uh, Miles Briggs raised about community pharmacies. Uh, oh, sorry, it was Alex Cole Hamilton. Sorry, uh, about community pharmacies and interacting with data GP practices. And it's certainly something that's been raised in my own constituency with community pharmacies um, and how much added value they could give to, to patients when, the, when they present there if they were able to access that data. GPs are currently data controllers, and you, and you raised an issue there about data controllers. Has there been any thought given to um, changing that position? So I'll take that. So um, the situation is that the, the, the referencing from community pharmacists has been access to the emergency care summary data, which is a summary of the, uh, an extract from GP systems, mostly of medication, um, and, and, and that would go hand in hand with pharmacy work. Um, the logic at the moment is that, 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 that are the governance behind the emergency care summary. What it was designed for as to what its use cases is, is, is potential is, is, is in conflict at the moment. So the, the important part is that you know it, the emergency care summary was designed for emergency care and secondary care. We've now pushed that boundary a little bit further into clinical portals to make that information available within and throughout secondary care. But to push that out to individual pharmacies and uh, independent contractors, as well um, that the GP uh, as the as the data controller have actually, um, you know, shown major concerns about that at the moment. Um, so we're actually working through that w with them, and hopefully that uh, there's also forming part of the new discussions with the GP contract, the new contract which is Im imminently going to be uh, announced. And I think that's been a, a, a a discussion point as part of that. So it's a positive landscape going forward because I think everyone recognises the value and the need. Um, it's just that there's 
you know, how we've set this up and what we've done in the past isn't quite straightforward to roll forward just willy-nilly to, to, to anybody. I think I, we're pretty confident there'll be a resolution yeah. Yeah. that will be a sensible one. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Ivan. Thanks, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, it was, you, you've kind of covered a bit of this already in your answer to, to Colin Smith's um, question a minute ago, but it was round about the, um, clearly we're, we're doing this IT because it gives us better patient experience and patient service, but we're also doing it because we think it makes things more efficient. Um, and with some examples of other countries and the, the evidence we took earlier, where there'd been, uh, there'd been savings as a consequence. So it was really just to understand um, whether you, you've taken a view on how much potentially is there in terms of cost savings um, or freeing up resources to go into um, more effective directions is probably a better way of putting it if people aren't spending all their time double and triple keying stuff and they can actually treat patients instead and we don't need to uh, help solve some of the, the resource issues we've got um, and, and other efficiency gains that are there to be had. So, so if you get a kind of macro view of that and then have you got what, what kind of mechanism have you got for tracking that at a more micro level? Now that will be built into e each transformation um, outcome, if you like. So if you take uh, modern outpatients, I mean the, the, the saving is time. Um, so if you um, are able to deliver particularly return appointments through uh, either uh, telephone or, or VC uh, interaction with the consultant, you know it, it saves a, a huge amount of time. And we know the pressure on the system with um, increasing demand for for outpatient appointments um, so the reform of that system and and interacting with patients and, and making sure it's done in a, in a safe way the safety comes first but with, without a doubt the, the the idea that someone for a routine return appointment is doing a six seven eight hour round trip um, not good for the patient but also the the clinicians time um, can be better spent uh, um, seeing more more patients um, who need that face-to-face -face contact and those who could have a, a, a phone or VC uh, um, consultation, um, you know that that I think will become routine. Um, so that's w one example of one change using technology. Um, so yes, you can put a, a number on that, and the modern outpatient program outlines. You know, the efficiency gains from that in terms of the the system, um, that you know you could time times that by by a thousand by a hundred thousand if we can get this right. So it's absolutely about delivering a more efficient system, but but for a purpose to then reinvest that time uh, in um, better better patient care. So I think I think the other thing you need to think about is the fact that you will do different things. Um, so it, you will not simply run the existing system more efficiently. You will do things that you currently can't do, um, and, and that's p part of the the, you know, the challenges to get to the place where you're now enabling people to manage their care directly themselves, making choices about lifestyle, making choices about how they engage, understanding better how to manage their condition using feedback from monitoring in the house, uh, being able to stay in contact with friends and family, you know, avoiding isolation and lo loneliness. You know, all of these things mean that you're now delivering a different health and care service. So a, a simple comparison isn't that straightforward. John Halambus, who's one of the expert advisors again also, one of Obama's advisors from, from, from Harvard, his, his advice is don't presume that you will take a cash saving from doing this. You, you probably won't. You will be able to do better in different things. You'll give time back to people. You'll take a lot of the just the hassle of having to enter m information into different <coughs> systems, you know, the, 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 the things that you know, wind people up. You'll take that out of the system. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll empower people to do better. And you know that's most of the gains are going to be in that quality space. The, the, you know they will. If, if you use Amazon, you buy more books. You will see other changes in terms of what happens. You know if you know you, you, so you'll see different ways in which this interacts with how people engage with healthcare systems. But so I think it's it's very reductive just to focus on are you going to save money? With well, apologies. I mean, yeah, and I said that at the start, the patient experience is well improved and understand that you'll move at a different dynamic where things are done done differently. But at the end of the day, time is money. I mean, it's because if you're, if you're making consultants 10%, 20% more efficient, means you can see more patients or whatever it happens to be. That means the, the other end, you've not got those weight unless you've not got the pressure to hire more, more um, uh, 
uh, practitioners to the same extent. So I, I don't think you can get away from the fact that there has to be a pay off there. Frankly, if you've not got a, 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 a view on that, then it's hard to quantify how successful you've been as well. Yeah. well we, we do, and we have uh, expectations of, of what what would be delivered. So, you know, you, again, if you take the the um, the multidisciplinary team and the support of the pharmacist to, to general uh, practice, um, you know, on, on uh, average, there can be a, a, a two hour a day saving potentially for the, the GP and having the, the pharmacist doing the medicine reconciliation. First of all, it's something that, 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 that um, you know, frankly, um, is uh, um, probably very frustrating for the GP and having to do all that at the end of the day. So someone else whose skills are that, doing that, you know, so the, the benefit gain, um, you know, is if we can gain um, anything up to, to, to two hours a day of a GP's time, then you know it doesn't take uh, a lot to then imagine that you know, whether that's in terms of the being able to see more patients or in terms of recruitment and retention issues, it has a huge knock-on effect. So uh, yes, and and we're working through the you know the, the the efficiency gain of what does that mean? And yes, there there are there are there will be a kind of a projected number at the end of that somewhere, but you know everybody knows it's there and it's there a prize to be gained, um, pot you know, potentially over a fairly quick period. Um, so that's that's absolutely the territory we're in here. It's it's all for a purpose. It's not some kind of theoretical. It's absolutely for a for a purpose of you know continued demands on a system that is absolutely needing to to get all of these efficiency gains in order to be able to, to keep the quality of care uh, being provided. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Ivan. Uh, Alison and then Brian. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, good afternoon now. Um, Alzheimer Scotland and the Mental Health Foundation emphasised the importance of staff skills and training to ensure that we could make the most of digital technology um, uh, you know, and to make sure these new interventions were used as effectively as possible. And other submissions have commented on a digital skills shortage in this country. So I'd like to understand what importance the strategy will place on making sure that staff are trained properly. How are we going to ensure that staff who are already very busy and pressurised have the time um, to undertake that training? And just if you could tell me a little bit about any steps that you're taking to address a skill shortage. Thank you. Uh, I mean, you make uh, an important point around making sure that you know there's no point in having the technology the systems or, you know if people are not trained to use it and so clearly um, making sure that um, the, the workforce is trained there is a subgroup on uh, called the digital enabled workforce subgroup which is really uh, around uh, ensuring that um, we know what the skill level is currently and what what the additional skills and training uh, would be. Um, and it's making sure that's done as part of any transformation rather than, I think Jeff, Jeff said this a few times and it's a point worth re-emphasising that it's not an add-on so you don't put all the things in place and say oh well there's your, your one day course on uh, that it's got to be built into to the changes uh, in the way things are done um, whether that's um, uh, in primary care or whether it's through the, the outpatient changes uh, and it has to be ongoing, so it can't be a, a one-off. So, uh, Graham, that's a kind of key yeah. part of the yeah. Of I mean, strategy. I, th I think, as as Cabinet Secretary said, the the it is so key. Um, and I think we've re re replied earlier around uh, if you get the product correct, the consumption of it then is easier. Um, it's that concept of you know who showed you how to use your iPhone. Uh, We've not went through formal training for things like that. So it's about getting the correct solutions, but also uh, NES, uh, National Education um, Scotland, have got a, a, a really interesting role in this because they've already identified themselves and setting up some of these groups that Cabinet Secretary's referred to and actually looking to explore new in ways and how we can actually enable the, the workforce. So it's early days, but it's, it's certainly uh, high on our thoughts at the moment. I just asked for specific information on that skills shortage 
that has been raised by a few submissions. Um, do you agree that there is a skill shortage and is there specific action being taken to address that? Well, I guess there's, there's, there's two things. One would be the, the technical specific skills that are required in order to deliver the, the clever stuff, if you like. So, um, then, and there's a huge competition for those skills because everybody's, you know, private industry is looking for those same skills, public sector is. So, there's those skills that are particular and technical that are required, and we have to make sure we can get those people. Um, and then there's the skills of the workforce that are going to use this technology. So, um, and the two things are, are slightly different um, or are different. Um, so in terms of the, the specific digital skills? Yeah. So, so we have got uh, challenges. Um, again, standardisation and doing things together as health boards is, is one key way we, we see our way through this. Uh, we see ourselves getting through this. Um, and, and also, the, you know, we haven't got an abundance of, of, of highly uh, articulated, um, you know, educated, um, experienced um, staff in Scotland so there is a lot of uh, health boards at the moment where people are being trained up it's about investing in our own staff which is a big part of, of what eHealth Leads discuss um, and that's that's fundamental because although we are an, an IT driven business now, our industry now um, what we do is pretty specific to health um, it's not just a general widget processing environment we work in, it's about making sure our End users are, 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 as you say, bring, they bring them with us. They design the systems. They we work with them to do so. So that whole skill set is is already um, well well underway in terms of, of how we em embrace our, our staff and, and support them to to become the, the champions of the future. Okay, thank you, uh, Brian. Okay, Vina. I was going to ask. Traditionally, a lot of the systems and, and platforms we currently work with are older platforms that have been up upgraded by uh, bolting on a lot of software uh, and inevitably that can lead to, to the declining integrity of that system and given as the cabinet secretary alluded to earlier on it's not architecture building a architecture that's the the problem here are you are you confident the current system has the scalability within its architecture or, or will, uh, to, 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 requ to do the required overhaul to deliver the, the government's uh, initiatives or are we looking at perhaps looking at a, 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 a delivering a new system here? Yeah, so, so there are some fundamental systems that span the whole, you know, are national. Um, the National CHI is a good example of that. Now, that's a mainframe computer, which I think is today now 23 years old. Now, to the man in the street, that might sound like something you wouldn't want to use. But, you know, without a fail for 23 years, that system has never been offline and it delivers a robust platform to allow us to, to deliver care safely and effectively through offering unique numbers on, on every interface to, of healthcare. So it's not about how old these things are, it's, it's about, it really spans into how interoperability they are. And the reason that CHI is getting reformed at the moment is not so much that we don't think it can carry on doing what it does very, very, very well, um, it's the interoperability of it. It's not as flexible as we are foreseeing the future needs um, for for doing, you know, for supporting things like innovation, APIs for for the small business enterprise to to to, to interface to the NHS. So there there are there are APIs that we need to try and build and enhance so that we can, you know, maximise the, the the investment um, from the the. Econ economic side of Scotland to, to to contribute towards you know some of the, the, these great ideas that small businesses can, can can come up with. So infrastructure in itself is 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 at the age of its n maybe a bit is not to look at that in isolation. I think the most important part is is to look at how interoperable things are. And certainly for the last you know half a dozen years, that's been a key kind of plank in, in everything we've done to make things standard to have sharing to have interoperability using standards that actually allow us to do that and 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 when we're doing that for the future I, I, I think I think beyond that though as we do the development certainly with the reform of Kai what we're looking to is a product which gives us significantly more than the previous product so it'll be something which gives us indexing and other services at, you know which enable us to do more I, th I think you should expect to see more of the activity within um, health and care 
to be based within the cloud rather than in physical systems, and that, again, is quite a transition. So there is an existing architecture, many elements of which we'll be taking into the new system, but fundamentally to have that platform, you will have a new architecture there. And that's not a single big IT project, that's a number of small projects, all of which work, all, all of which work together to work together. Um, but you know, things are things are different than they were 15 years ago when people went out and bought big mainframes. You now buy services, you know, you don't buy kit, um, and you don't buy product. You know, you buy um, you buy products, not product. And you and and so I think you are looking for to quite a change to have the sort of capability that we want for the future. And some elements of that are in the primary care modernisation already, but you know, single identifier through Kai that operates across health and care, not just across health. Um, you know, also looking at things such as single logon, single sign-on, so you don't have to sign on to 27 different systems. Remember, remembering 13 different passwords, if you want to do, if you want to, you know, so things which enable you to interact with the system, you know, go beyond simply preserving what we've got. It's about how you tie it together, and so, so there is quite a change there. Thank you. I'm going to say I, I, I feel your pain on that because uh, I recently got a password manager to manage all my passwords, then forgot the password of the password manager. <laughs> um, so the final point I, um, I, I would make is on the health inequalities. Obviously, within Scotland, there's quite a significant uh, digital inequality and in, in, you know IT inequality in communities. Um, uh, is moving down this route going to further exacerbate health inequality, or is it going to um, narrow it? We want it to narrow it and we need to make sure um, that we take that on board in terms of how, particularly when you're looking at how patients interact with the systems um, and making sure that, uh, you know, it, it's not just for those kind of uh, young folk who are able to use smartphones. It has to be for everybody. Um, so I think we're very mindful of that, Jeff, in terms of how we make sure that there's an equality of access and, and being able to yeah. use the, the, your own data. Yeah, so I, I was glad that you thought of me as one of the young folk there. Which well, is, which just because I was for... looking at it, I didn't mean I was... <laughs> okay. um, I, I think the work that's going on in terms of the social security agency is really good on this. In, in that they are looking for highly digitally enabled s services, but understand that doesn't work for everyone. So they're thinking about navigators and people who support um, people through the social security process, you know, who where they don't have that degree of literacy or aren't that um, comfortable with it. I would have chosen, I have to say, in terms of the social security system, when we see the problems that people are experiencing. Uh, I, I was thinking in terms Scottish of the, the, the developments ones. and the proposals which are being brought forward by the Scottish government. Uh, and, and so, so they, you know, they are looking for a digital first yeah. approach, but one which understands that doesn't work for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. For those very reasons that you're thinking of. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so, so again, that's the same sort of space within health. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you know, we do know that the, um, while there are challenges around deprivation in terms of how people interact with services at the moment, that also has the potential to change as you offer services in different ways and as you have different platforms. And people do use smartphones. Um, you know, there's challenges around different cohorts in terms of use of technology, but you need to have be able to play all the different lines. You need to have the technology as well as the face-to-face. -face, so. Okay. Um, thank you very much uh, for your attendance this morning and also spend briefly until uh, the panel leaves.
Uh, agenda item two is a chance for the committee to discuss the informal evidence session that held this morning with NHS patients to discuss NHS uh, clinical governance. Sorry, uh, could I invite any comments from members on the um, session we had earlier this morning, Alec? Thank you, convener. Yeah, firstly, thanks to the clerks for arranging it. I think it's important for us to have those sessions periodically to to meet uh, patients who've had bad but also good experiences of uh, the NHS. I think it's important to keep a balance in getting those perspectives and also proportionality as well. Um, Claire and I were with a group of patients or their supporters um, who'd had very bad experiences of care um, in the health service. Lots. The, the, the one kind of um, overriding theme was a cultural problem, I think, in some cases where um, the, the procedures within certain hospitals were just not fleet of foot enough to deal with particular aspects of care that were individual to those patient needs. We had one gentleman who had to have medication at a certain time, but because the practice in the hospital was only to give out medication at medication time, he was suffering as a result of that, and it didn't seem flexible enough to accommodate his particular needs. Similarly, um, there was a... a a, a very concerning view um, that this uh, uh, another family that we saw who had been had a, almost a lifetime's worth of experience with the NHS given their daughter's condition had had cause to complain several times to the point where the daughter had asked the parents not to complain anymore because she felt it was impacting on the relationships that she had with NHS staff and I, I think that that's a, a very worrying reality if uh, pay, parents or patients themselves are concerned about complaining if they think it will have a tangible negative impact on their care um, then then we're doing something wrong okay thank you Claire uh, thank you convener I'd just like to put on record my thanks to the uh, the, the many um, patients and carers and family who came along today I think they were uh, very honest um, with us and um, shared some very difficult um, experiences um, some very uh, personal details about what had happened in their lives um, and that must have been quite difficult for them to do to come along and speak to strangers uh, uh, about such uh, uh, such intimate details and I'd, like I say I would just like to put on record my thanks um, for them sharing that with us yeah, I think we would all agree with that most definitely Brian yeah, I'll, I'll put, I was going to say I was going to put on record for the two uh, ladies that uh, um, gave me their evidence, given that uh, th it's very raw to them that um, both their husbands died a year ago on the same day uh, of sepsis in the same ward. Um, and uh, they were very forthcoming in their experiences, and, and I, that, that couldn't have been easy. But um, it was around uh, serious incident review uh, and their um, understanding of, of, of a serious incident review that uh, they felt that, um, although they hadn't made an official complaint at the time, um, it was a, a, a serious interview was, it was instigated, they felt it was driven by them. Um, there was very little information coming back from uh, the NHS Trust themselves. Um, uh, and, and ultimately, when the uh, report came out, it came out almost, they, they've got a year to make a complaint, um, and they felt that they were put under pressure not to complain um, and, and they were given the, the results of the report almost on the year. Uh, the report, if you hadn't have a medical background, it was very difficult to understand. Um, it didn't run in chron chronological order. There was no conclusion. Um, and uh, worse than that was that uh, the, the report itself, internal report was quite damning. Uh, on the processes that had, uh, they call them missed opportunities. They don't like that terminology, I have to say, and that had led to the death uh, of these two, two men. But then there was an external report that went completely against that. So there's two conflicting reports, and there's no process in place to try and see why that is. Um, and then there's no, the, the NHS themselves are not coming forward with any next steps they're going to take. They can't tell the, the, the ladies the recommendations that have been put forward, who's going to do that, how it's going to do that, and how it's going to be measured, and that they saw a report of five years ago that basically stated exactly the same recommendations that still haven't been implemented. So I think there is a, a cultural issue here. 
Uh, I also think, it, just for the record, I think it'd be quite useful to be able to speak to the, the trust in question to get them to give their side of it and also to see how they're going to reconcile these two different reports and how they're going to take this forward. Health board in question. Health yeah. board in question. Health board in yeah. question, yeah. yeah. Uh, Colin. Thanks very much, Convener. I, mean, I think, like other members, I thought it was a very good session. Uh, I would certainly place on record thanks to those um, who came along and gave evidence. Um, Ivan and I had um, two very harrowing experiences from family members, but there were two very different outcomes uh, when it came to how the Health Board approached it in the long term. One example we're given uh, where the family member actually played a, a key role after the, the, the harrowing incident in helping shape services within that health board and actually implementing changes uh, to the way in which the, the, the hospital was run and, and changes that are that are being rolled out across that particular health board. So from something that was a very unpleasant harrowing experience for, for a family, they were able to, to, to actually deliver some real change. So I think it's maybe a good example um, of, of a positive outcome in the long term that, that, that would certainly be worth uh, the committee uh, considering uh, how we can see that being rolled out um, elsewhere. Um, but I think from the other case, uh, it highlighted some of the, the real cultural challenges that we face in which patients are, are, and their families are not being properly listened to in a lot of examples. Okay, thanks, Colin. Uh, Ivan. Yeah, just like to back up what Colin said uh, and, and give thanks to the two, um, two women that came along, relatives of, of patients, and gave their, um, at length, their particular take on... Um, the situations that they'd been involved with and, and both are continuing to work very hard to uh, to drive improvement for the benefits of the, the health service as a whole which I think is, is commendable um, and I think there was one thing that, that came out was the need for the the care to be person-centered and how we talk about that it was clear from the um, the, the evidence that they gave us that um, that that very very often wasn't wasn't the case um, and we've got, uh, in certain cases, a long way to go. But as Colin said, very positive that a lot of concrete, specific things had happened um, in one case in particular, and that really um, bodes well, shows what, what can be done, and uh, there's a significant scope to roll those improvements out right across the whole health service in Scotland. Okay, thanks, Ivan. Uh, Alison? Um, thank you. Um, as you'll be aware, convener, you and I met with... Um, a gentleman who was representing his his family's tragic case and his experience in his own, uh, you know, with his own NHS health board, and it was very difficult listening. He was incredibly well prepared. His notes would do, you know, a committee clerk justice. They were immaculately presented. They were well researched, and um, I think he is certainly someone that. The committee, indeed Parliament and probably government, could learn a lot from. Um, despite the emotional, difficult nature of his evidence, I think he taught us a lot this morning. We learned that the way that he and his family had been described by professionals, um, clinicians, I think, and management, uh, was completely and utterly unacceptable. I think it should be looked into. Um, you know, I think no health board should, should feel challenged by questions, but they should welcome them and they have to be in a position to answer them fully um, and honestly. And I, th I think that has been that's been lacking in this case. He brought up the fact that a lot of data gathering isn't up to scratch. Um, you know, he mentioned that 11 percent of Scottish data is illegible. You know, so the real issues there. He also pointed out that I think is. Um, Mr. Whittle mentioned earlier, you know, one the the draft data would look remarkably different to that that was accepted and published as as the final report. Um, yeah, so I, I would just like to you know say thank you very much um, to him for the the evidence and information he shared with us this morning. Anyone else, Miles? Yeah. yeah Jenny, Tom, and myself um, met with two. Um, groups who specifically hadn't necessarily put a complaint in. Um, and I think our experience, or certainly my, ex my experience, was that because ongoing treatment's taking place, they didn't want to uh, sort of share their negative experiences. But um, as Alison has said, um, it certainly was highlighted that in both of these cases where it was a mental health concern, that they, were, they felt that they were being blamed for, for part of um, their experience when they were meeting with professionals and to some extent seen as troublemakers if they were. Um, and I think what I took out of it certainly was that although there is a welcome 
um, move towards a very much patient-focused um, side to our health service, that actually in many mental health cases, the family focus mm. needs to be really key priority for those um, who are putting in place support because they felt they were cut out or um, you know their experiences and actually the care and support they were providing at home wasn't being valued. And I think probably finally, it was just again, um, as this committee's heard consistently, pathways to getting mental health before it becomes a crisis just certainly were not in place. And I would just add that these two points that Mills makes are related because if the concerns had been taken seriously <coughs> at an earlier stage, an intervention could have been made and that opportunity was missed, something similar to what Brian Whittle was highlighting in his remarks. Thanks again to uh, the individuals that we spoke to this morning. Um, I think there was a disconnect highlighted in terms of accessing mental health for uh, children and not listening to family members in that instance. Um, and that's obviously a specific issue that needs to be looked at because your family members are those closest to you and often are able to flag up concerns to the relevant professionals whilst if it's affecting you, you might not be able to. So, so I think the system does need to be more cognizant of the impact that families can have in terms of sharing that information with relevant professionals, be that in the medical sector or be that in schools, and joining that information together. And, and what we were hearing this morning is that the information just wasn't being shared. Yeah. And in specifically in mental health, um, early assessments yeah. um, was a, a, something which feeds beyond this piece of work, I think, that actually if that was put in place, um, they maybe have had early interventions. And then actually what was really concerning, I think we heard, was the fact that um, although their GP was mm -hmm. um, doing a huge amount of support to them, his referral finally yeah. resulted in um, this individual not being seen, but a letter coming back saying nothing was wrong and actually the language within that about the family being unacceptable, mm -hmm. even though they'd never actually met this person writing that letter okay. about them. So I think that was something which certainly needed to be pursued. In one individual case, it was, what was alarming was there was only a substantive intervention when the individual's physical health was threatened, um, and that could, as I, say, I said previously, have been avoided. But the fact that there was an intervention relating to the individual's mental health, but only at the stage where it got to their um, life was threatened as a consequence. Yeah. And this was a family as well who were trying to seek help. Mm -hmm. They were putting their head above the parapet, they were asking for that assistance and they were being batted away for whatever reason. I said as was a GP. Okay, thanks very much for that. I think, uh, you know, the, the case that Alison and I uh, uh, spoke to, there was very serious um, issues around governance, particularly around serious, uh, significant adverse events, and that is something that we will uh, speak to the, uh, the committee clerks about so that we cover that. And if MD's got individual issues that came up during the conversations that you think may be missed, then please um, uh, speak to the team. Um, but I think it was a very worthwhile session this morning and I would certainly put on record all our thanks uh, for the people who came and uh, it must have been very difficult given some of the circumstances that we discussed um, but they, they, they certainly um, uh, very eloquently put forward their uh, cases and I think that has been very helpful to inform our discussions and deliberations and if I could ask the uh, clerk and team to write to them just thanking them for their, um, uh, their, their efforts this morning. Um, okay, well now, as agreed earlier, we're going to private session.